Welcome, everyone. I think it's uh, about time to get started. Welcome to my talk about HEDI, a gradual and multilingual programming language. My name is Feline Hermans. I'm a professor at VU, de Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. And I'm going to take you through the three most important points of the programming language HEDI that I made. They are already here. These are the three most important points that you're going to learn about today. Haiti is a gradual language, it's a multilingual language, and it's a language that is built for teaching. And each of those we will cover today in detail with a specific interest, more emphasis on the multilingual aspect of Haiti. But before we go into Hedy, let's go back into my personal history a little bit. We have to go back to the year 2013 when I started to teach kids. Um, and these were about middle school age, so kids between 10 and 14 in a programming club, they wanted to learn programming and they were looking for a teacher to teach them programming. And then I thought, oh, well, this will be fun. And uh, these kids want to love want to learn programming, so they already have an interest, they already have a love. This will simply be very easy. I didn't know a lot about teaching, but I did know a lot about programming. I thought they are 10 year olds. How hard can this be, right? This is going to be easy. And what happened then is sort of subconsciously, I remembered how I learned programming when I was a kid. So this is me when I was 10, behind my dad's really big computer at the time, learning programming. So this is the early 90s that we're talking about. And in those days, I didn't have a programming teacher. There weren't programming lessons or programming clubs, no adults in my life knew programming. So I never really sat through a programming lesson when I was a kid. And therefore I also didn't really have a good idea of what a programming lesson could or should look like because I never took a programming lesson until I was already an 18 year old in university. So how did I learn programming? I had this, I had this book, Basic Computer Games that I got from a library. And this was a book that would allegedly help you to create games on your computer with BASIC, but it wasn't a book that said, this is a variable, this is a loop, this is a condition. If you would open this book, it would be this. this printed out listings. That, that was the book. There was no like CD-ROM or a floppy drive or a download link because those things didn't really exist yet. Also, if you can read the font, there are English words here like velocity. My native language is not English. When I was 10, I didn't have any clue what this was, but you know, I had a lot of time. There was no Netflix, there was no TikTok. So <laughs> I could easily spend the whole afternoon just copying codes. I had a lot of fun. And this is how I learned programming. And it's not just me. Many people my age, I see some people smiling in the audience. Many people my age, like children of the 70s and 80s, learned programming this way. And therefore, we may have some mild mental damage now uh, because we think that compilers are lovely teachers. We think because we learned programming this way, without a teacher, but with our friend, the compiler, that this is a good way to learn programming. And that's certainly what I thought when I started to teach in that programming club. I thought, well, I just print out some listings and I give them to the kids and like me, they will sit patiently in silence and copy these codes into the computer and then they will learn and everyone will be happy. Um, yeah, people are already laughing now, like they know that this is not going to end well. It didn't end well, indeed. To give you a little bit more context on the programming lessons. Initially, we started with a programming language called Scratch. Who here has used Scratch or seen Scratch before? Yeah, so this is a visual programming language. You could say it's a little bit like software Legos. You click blocks together and then stuff happens. Like this program will cause the cat to turn around and meow. Initially, kids were super excited. Oh, I can make really cool things with Scratch. Everything was fine. But then as the kids aged, they would say, well, teacher, this is a toy. We want to do grown-up programming. I'm already 12, right? I'm an adult. Don't give me this children stuff. Give me a real programming language for professionals. I was like, no problem, kid. If you don't want to do Scratch, we can do Python. Python is an easy to learn language, very user friendly, not hard at all. Let's go from Scratch to Python. This is Python. Probably most of you are familiar with this. I told the kids, well, you just do prints and then brackets and then quotes, and then you do whatever you want to print in between the quotes and the brackets, and then you get text on the screen. And the kids were like, text on the screen. 
impressive. <laughs> like for me as a 10 year old, it was very cool to get text on the screen. But they're like, well, we just had a dancing cat. So not so very fun. But there were other issues as well. For example, if you make a tiny mistake, like for example, you have an uppercase P here, it's like a reasonable thing to do because sentences should start with uppercase letters. Does Python say, oh, you made a tiny mistake, maybe you should make this a smaller case letter? Or does Python say, oh, no problem, I understand what you mean? No, no, Python says, name error, name print is not defined. So here the kids are like, this is weird, right? On the one hand, a computer can easily calculate 17 times 471, but at the same time, it does not understand that the letter P is also the letter P. So they, they were somewhat losing their motivation. But it got worse. Here's another one. Print is there, brackets are there, quotes are there, but only the final bracket has been forgotten. It's clearly, cl it's clear what this program is meant to be doing, but Python says, syntax error, unexpected EOF while parsing. Teacher, teacher, what is parsing? It's like, this is my favorite topic, sit down, I can talk to you about parsing all day long. But you don't want to talk about parsing, right, in the first lesson. Also note the error message says line three. Teacher, teacher, there is no line three. The computer is confused. So they lost their motivation slowly, and it got worse. This is maybe my favorite example. Teacher, I did everything right. Everything is there. Print, quotes, brackets, nothing can stop me now. <laughs> Except from this space. It's like an invisible error. The, everything is correct, but there's a space there. Clearly, Python should be able to handle this. No, indentation error, unexpected indent. So in a short span of a few weeks, these kids got from really excited to learn a textual language into never mind, I will quit this programming club, or never mind, I will go back to the toy because clearly I'm not smart enough to do grown-up programming, which was sad. So after a while, I thought, okay, Maybe compilers are not lovely teachers. Maybe this worked for me and you know, for all of my friends that are also programmers, but clearly that's survivor bias, because apparently we're the type of people that really like to learn this way, but there are many other ways that you could also learn and become a programmer. And I got really interested at that point. As I mentioned, I don't have a background in education. I have a background in software engineering. So I was like, these kids, they can think, right? They can. They can write, they can read, clearly their brains work. How did other stuff get into their brains? How did they learn language, for example? And if you dive into how other fields that are in computer science teach stuff to kids, you'll see that this goes in a step-by-step -step way. If you're teaching writing to a five or a six-year-old, they might just start with letters, right? They do this. Imagine your five-year-old has just written this, and you will say, Syntax error, unexpected floating A. <laughs> this is not how we teach writing, because it would be very, very demotivating to have to get everything right. If, if your kid does this, you're like, well done, buddy. Most of these things are letters. <laughs> Yay. And then slowly the rules change. Like you start with letters, and then you have words. You group the letters into words. And then you say, hey, you know, a sentence should actually really, in grown-up language, start with a capital letter. And the kids practice that. Yeah, okay, got it. Next rule. From now on, sentences should end in a period. Kids practice a lot. And this is not just syntax. Adding a period into your vocabulary as a young writer means that you can now do sentences that span multiple lines. Initially, a line and a sentence are the same thing for a young learner, and then later the concept split. So what writing does is they start very simple and gradually add syntax, and with that also concepts. And then I thought, well, I know how to build programming languages. This is what I, I, I studied for my PhD, was on creating programming languages. I could make a programming language that works in this gradual way. And that's what became Heli, a programming language that, like writing, gradually changes as the kids advance. So this is just a few parts of Heli, because there's a lot to talk about. But this is level one. So in level one of Heli, you just have the keyword print, it syntax highlights, and then you have text like Hello Copenhagen, 
and this just outputs. You don't have to do anything at all in terms of syntax, you just have to type print right. And this way kids can get used to the idea of programming. Oh, I put something here, this is where the code goes, this is where the output goes, this is where the button is. They can get used to programming without having to do everything at once. If you make a mistake, like you confuse a D and a T, which is likely in my native language, then you'll get an error message that's somewhat reasonable. It will tell you that that is not a command, and because the language is so small, it just has five keywords in level one, it's easy to suggest even the right keyword. So this is actionable. If the kid makes a mistake, it's clear what they should do next. What I also mentioned is that just outputting text is quite non-exciting to kids. So from level one, we immediately have user interaction. So you can ask something, and then a little pop-up appears, and then you can repeat the answer back to the user. Because smart kids with the print, if you do print hello world, they would say, yeah, why do I do prints? I can just open Word and type hello world, right? Why am I doing this? So here it's clear why you're doing this, because you can do hello Copenhagen, how are you? And then you can type great, and then it says, so you are great. So it's immediately clear why we're programming, because now you can do something here that you cannot do in Word. You can ask someone for input and do something with the input. This is level two. In level two, we introduce variables, but we do it in a sort of syntax-free way. So I'll give you like a second to process what's going on here. Name is Felina is an assignment, and then we do print hello name, and this actually runs. I know some people, like yesterday I did the same talk here at IT University and then someone said that this code was offending them. <laughs> like, this is offensive. Because wait, but, wait, but hello is a string, but name is a variable, and how does the computer know which is, well, we, we just parsed twice. It's not really hard from a technical perspective to get this to run. And now the kid can really focus on what is a variable. What, what am I doing? I'm storing something in the computer and I'm reusing it later. In level four, we introduce quotes, but only quotes. So in level four, they already have seen a variable, they know a little bit about programming, and then we say, hey, you need, you need to actually use quotes for string values. So it really gradually amps up. And then in level seven, we add a re repeat statement, but it is not for i in range brackets, colon, it's just repeat three times and then you could do something. And like having natural language without a period, it's not super expressive, but it's enough to get concepts across. And the whole way that Hedy works is we have 18 levels, and then level 18 is a functioning subset of Python. So they really slowly go towards something that is an actual, actual language that is Python. Now, there's a lot more that could be said about the gradual nature of Hedy, but today I really want to zoom in on this multilingual part. And there's a lot of resources on our website, hedy.org, if you do want to know more about this gradual nature and how all the levels differ from each other and build up upon each other. So let's talk about code. How does this work internally? We have our code, the Hedy source code. Then we have a grammar. This is a way that describes what the programming language will look like. So you can have print, keyword print, followed by text, or asked, followed by text. If you have a grammar and code, then you can parse that into a parse tree that represents the structure of the program. And then what we do with our parse tree is we convert Hedy sort of to Python. Conceptually, you say we, we add the brackets and we add the quotes, and then we have Python. However, you also just saw that it runs in the browser. So you're like, well, you have Python and the browser. Those are not friends. So here we use Lark, that's a, a parser framework. And here, to get the Python to the front end, we use Sculpt, which is a re-implementation of Python in JavaScript, allowing us to run the generated Python in the browser. So that's the gradual nature of Hedy and how it works a little bit under the hood. And these things like Lark and Sculpt, they will be relevant later in the talk. So they are here for a reason. The other thing that makes Hedy unique as a textual language is that Hedy is a multilingual programming language. As I said, I'm a researcher at a university, but initially my research was not about programming education. My research was about programming language design. But once I started to teach these kids and once I started to design Hedy, I thought 
this is also an interesting research topic. I could, I could like measure if they like this. So early on when we carried Hattie, this is about early 2020, we did a study with kids, but is this a thing you would like? So we did a user study with 39 children from the school where I also teach. Uh, this was online lessons because it was the pandemic, so it was a very interesting experience to have 30 12-year-olds in a Zoom meeting trying to get them to do programming and tell me what they liked about it. That in itself was an interesting lesson. And we asked the kids, like, what are the things that you like about Hedy and how could we make Hedy better for you? It turned out that kids said that they really, really like this step-by-step -step approach. Some of them compared it themselves to systems like Scratch or programming in Python in a tool like Replit. They said, well, if I open Scratch, I don't know what to do. It doesn't tell me where to start. Whereas Hedy tells me what to do because the options are just very limited. And what I really like, this is, I think this was the moment where I thought, okay, now like I've struck gold. It's still deep in the ground, but this is going somewhere. The teacher of that class said, when we did Python last year, some kids learned a lot about programming, but very often those were like, Little failiness. Those were kids that were like, I want to learn programming. I'm so excited. I have all the patience in the world for this. So those kids would learn programming. But he also said the other like two thirds of the class just wouldn't learn anything. They would hit the syntax barrier, this brick wall of syntax errors, and they would just like drop out and never come back. And he said with Hedy, all kids learn some programming. Some kids might read level seven and others might read level 18 or actual Python, but everyone gets somewhere. And that's so much better than just a small portion of the group getting somewhere and a big portion getting nowhere. And I really thought like, yes. So then we started to ask the kids, how can we make Hedy better? And it was, this was such a cool experience to sit down with a 12 year old sort of at their level and listen to their input. It was an interesting reflection also on, let's say, a school system where usually kids are listening and their input isn't really necessarily very welcome in all classrooms. And here they were allowed to tell me how I was doing bad as their teacher, which they really enjoyed. One thing that they said is, well, had he could have better error messages, <laughs> I'm like, Seriously, like, have you seen Python? Have you seen C++? Like, I think we're doing great. Show me an error message that you didn't like. He's like, this one, this is bad. Like, why is this bad? Look, okay, you cannot put a comma there. It's, it's very clear. It says there's a mistake at line one, position 12. This is the exact right location. And it says what you should not do there. So I tell this kid, read this error message to me aloud because I think they have not read the error message, right? It's a kid, it's just not reading very well. So the kid goes, yeah, uh, line one, position 12, you typed, but that is not allowed. Because what, what have we taught them, 12 year olds for six years? If you see a comma, you take a little pause. So the kid is reading, you typed, but that is not allowed, which also is a sentence. So the kid's like, why cannot I do type? I'm typing all the time. Why does it let me not type? And I was like, <laughs> like, this is why you sit down next to users and have them tell you how your system works for them. <laughs> because I could have seen in the database that this wasn't a, a good error message, but never in the world would I have understood why. So now we have this, actually, this is our newer user interface where all symbols are vocalized in words. So it's a comma or a question mark or a semicolon. All these words, kids tend to skip over them because they're not trained in reading these characters. So it is like a tiny thing that we improved. Another thing that kids said in this study is, yeah, we would like to have Dutch keywords. So these are Dutch teenagers, 12, 13 year olds. They're quite proficient in English. And they said, yeah, we would like to program in Dutch. So I was like, why? And they were like, why not? It's like, yeah, you know, why not? And just to give you again a little bit of context, the kids then were used in a, to use a multilingual user interface from the start. So everything in this study that they had used was Dutch. The explanations were Dutch, the texts were Dutch, the UI elements were Dutch, even the error messages from the beginning had been multilingual. So everything was localized for them 
only the keywords were not localized. So of course it would make sense for them. Like everything is Dutch, but why not this one element? It's like, why not? <laughs> because it's a lot of work and I'm the one that has to do it. That's why not. But you know, it was still the pandemic. So I was also, my, my, I was nerd sniped. Do you know this concept that someone poses a challenge and you're like, yeah, I just want to know if I can do this. So. I did actually make the whole interface multilingual. And let's talk a bit about how that actually works. So again, this is the architecture that we have. And it's actually not so very hard to localize a grammar. You can just say, well, <laughs> in Dutch it's easy, print is print, and echo is echo. You only have to do ask anyway. And you just, in the grammar, you just swap out ask, and you put vraag there. So I put this on the internet, like, look, this is a switchable language. And then Mark Guzdiel, he's also a computer science education professor working with uh, Spanish-speaking people, in the, uh, students in the US, he said, hey, Felina, do you know uh, bilingual people exist? I'm like, oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, that makes sense. Probably bilingual people want to not limit themselves to one language, but actually mix keywords in different languages. OK, OK, this is not so hard. Instead of one language in the grammar, we can just swap out all the keywords and you do the one or the other. So I'm like, yeah, I feel really good about myself. Like, wow, cool. I made a multilingual programming language. <laughs> I'm proud. But then sadly in your life, often you have people that hold you to even higher standards than you are willing to go. One of my best friends is from Palestine. And he said, so Hermans, very impressive, this multilingual language with those Latin languages from left to right. Now do Arabic. <laughs> like, no, I do not want to do Arabic, man. This is a lot of work, and I'm the one who has to do this. But again, it was cool. Like, I wanted to have this challenge. It was still the pandemic, so what else did I have to do? So we actually made it multilingual also in non-Latin and right-to-left languages. Let's do this. So let's talk a little bit about a not so very short history of making Hedy actually non-Latin and right to left working. Let's first talk about variable names. So as I mentioned, for our grammar, we use a framework called LARC. And maybe it's me, but usually if I use a framework, I do not read the code I'm importing, right? I just say import, and then in this case, I had imported something that was a C name, like a defined variable name from this parser framework. Then I don't have to do the work. Turns out that this C name, if you actually read the code that's in Lark, um, is variable names start with an underscore or a letter, and then an underscore or a letter or a number. Reasonable, yeah? What is a letter? It is an uppercase or a lowercase letter. What is an uppercase or a lowercase letter? Oh, those letters. Not everyone's letters. Hardly anyone's letters, actually. And this is even relevant if you're not talking about localized keywords. Here's a Danish program that I got from Google Translate, so sorry if it's offensive. <laughs> I did my best. But I think this means something like, the quantity is how often should I do this, and then it will repeat quantity times uh, I love Copenhagen. This code will already not work in the LARC framework because that er there isn't in between A and Z. So that would actually give this error message, not anymore, but then it would give this error message because it the parser stops after two letters and then gives up. And then says, hey, you didn't use a command in line one. So kids will be like, well, did I not use one command? I used two commands. Why are you shouting at me? So this is already an issue for many, many people, even if it's not about localizing keywords. So then sadly, if you want to improve, sometimes your code does not get better. This is actually what we have now as variable name definitions, which is also what Python uses. It's this. This is the start of a variable name. <laughs> They're like, what? <laughs> what is this? Those are Unicode character classes. And then this is all possible letters in all alphabets. And this is all numbers in all numeral systems. So it's not very readable, but it is very inclusive. Let's talk about right to left parsing. This is the thing I was most worried about. I thought, oh no, but then text is like this, but then it parses like this, and everything will be really confusing. But this was actually the easy part. Parsing 
right to left is not really hard because in a computer there is no right to left or left to right. All strings that are in a computer just start with the first letter that you type and then the next letter and then the next letter. If in our Western way we want to see that as left to right, you can interpret it as right to left code is also written le uh, left to right in the computer, but there is no left right, right? Your memory, the memory of your computer isn't in any direction anyway. So this is not the hard part. The text is just stored in a left to right way or in a traditional way. Um, this does lead to interesting situations. For example, if you're debugging. So this is print something. And if I'm debugging and I'm printing that input string, I will get the input string as I see it now, because my editor knows it's Arabic, so it swaps it out. But now if I want to have the first element of this string, I will actually get the first letter, which is the first letter that's shown. But my Western brain is like, why is that not an exclamation mark? This keeps confusing me all the time. Note also how this letter, this is the G in Arabic, this is the same letter. And you see that it is sh shown differently depending on the letter that comes next. Arabic has ligatures, means that letters have to be connected to each other if they both have like a tail end. This will also be relevant in a few slides. Anyone see an issue with the presentation being left up to programs if we're talking about we're parsing Python? What could go wrong here? Okay, I'll show you. What about brackets? Like, if this is my code and I'm reading this way, then the first bracket I encounter is a closing bracket, right? So now I have to change my parser into closing brackets being opening brackets. Oh no, this is going to be very confusing. This too is not really a problem because your operating system actually fixes this for you. If you're in Arabic mode and you type a closing bracket, it will store an opening bracket in memory so that it parses correctly and then fonts render it the other way around so that it shows correctly. Like, thank you, operating systems people. That was actually quite a delicate, nice choice. So we don't have any issues. We don't have to change the grammar. We don't have to change the parser because right to left, it isn't a thing. That's not only good, but in this case, it was actually quite good. The downside of presentations be presentation being left up to programs is that not all programs love people equally. Like this is PyCharm, and this is, you see the keywords here are between quotes, uh, sorry, between curlies, that's for parsing reasons. So PyCharm actually shows right to left code easily mixed with left to right code, that is the keyword, there's no problem there. PyCharm is software that loves me, uh, but there's also Vim. Vim is software that does not love me or anyone else, I think. So this is Vim. Vim just doesn't render right to left at all. Everything you open, it just renders left to right. It doesn't matter if it's mixed or if it's Arabic, it just goes left to right. So these purple circles that you see here, this is the same word. And this is because of the ligatures I mentioned before. So in English or Dutch, my native language, if you would have letters in the other order, you could sort of still recognize the letters because it would just be swapped. But for Arabic, this is even worse because the letters render differently because if they're in reverse, they're next to different letters. So that word, like in the bottom, how Vim shows it, like my Arabic friends tell me that th they can figure it out because many software is bad, so they know this is the issue, but it doesn't really read like anything. So that is the downside of, pres of the operating system having no opinion and then programs being responsible. Let's talk about numbers. So this is where we're now, right? So we're a little bit further in my story. So we have keywords that are now localized and everything works right to left. We have the editor swapped. We did a lot of CSS magic because our framework, all CSS front-end framework also didn't really support it, but we are here. We have repeat three times, print, hello everyone in Arabic. Yes, I am happy. But then there's a three there, you know, this tree. That's not a problem in Arabic. Those are Arabic numerals, right? No, actually this doesn't work because this three 
is not what Arabic speakers use. They use a different character. So if we have this print, it nicely converts to a range tree and it gives output. This works. But these Arabic numerals, they are not Arabic numerals. We call these things Arabic numerals, but Arabic actually uses these characters. They use different numerals for numbers than we are used to, which I didn't know. Right? And then on one hand side, you could say, well, Felina, why don't you know this? Right? Educate yourself in inclusivity. Why don't you know this? But on the other hand, in my country, in the Netherlands, if you're a 12-year-old, it's mandatory by law in the Netherlands that you know Roman numerals that no one uses, like no one, clocks, buildings. Well, 300 million people use these numerals and then nowhere in elementary school someone explains this to you. And also in computer science education, I probably took like five compiler courses in my undergrad and in grad school. None of those compiler courses ever had any definition of numbers that was different from zero to nine. That was this, or Chinese, or Hindi, or Bengali. There are like 26 different numeral systems. So on the one hand side, this is like all me. On the other hand, this is also an issue in society and in computer science specifically, where we just tend to generalize, and then we generalize away from many people that are not this skin color and this continent. And this really, really goes deep, right? Here's an example. In Python, you can just print 2 plus 9, and of course this works, and this becomes 11. If in Python you do print Arabic 2 plus Arabic 9, then it doesn't run. Like, it doesn't even only not run, it tells you invalid character. And to I think to call this a bug is like a category error. This is, this is not a bug, like this is an injustice. Uh, there's a British philosopher, Miranda Fricker, and she calls this epistemic injustice. Epistemic is the knowledge of knowledge. And here, not everyone has been equally given the right to participate in knowledge description. Like a programming language is the description of knowledge, and then the knowledge, the simple knowledge of numbers isn't even in there. That's really like a deep, deep issue, and many programming languages suffer from this issue. And if you think about computer science as a whole, right? At this moment, on Mars, there are six Mars robots running on Mars with software. That's so cool. Like, this is why people choose computer science, to do software like that. Like, we had this keynote the other day with an astronaut. How cool is it that there's software on Mars? Like, yeah, you know, people like, yeah, this is cool. I love this. This is why I love computer science. But in the same universe that we, as humanity, have been able to send robots to Mars, 2 plus 9 in Python doesn't run. Like, this is not the universe I want to be in. This is a problem. So this actually is Arabic 3. I think this is not hard. I changed the parser. No, it's not our 0 to our 9. It's the Arabic 0 to the Arabic 9. And then it will work. It just generates this Python, like it, the 3 is now the 3. And no. No, this doesn't work. You see this error message that we saw before. Invalid character in identifier. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Why is this invalid character in identifier. Why isn't this syntax error an expected character? Probably like no one cares about this error message, but I, again, now I'm nerd snipes. Why? This is a weird error message. I want to understand what's happening here. Why does it think this could be an identifier? So let's dive into this issue a little bit. I is three, this works, and I print I, I get three, this works. Now, if I try to define a variable name in Arabic, so I do three and then the g, uh, so it's like p3 or x3, and then I print the, try to print the variable name, then it says this name is not defined, right? I, I point to a variable name that doesn't exist. This is the whole program, so there's nothing above it. This variable name doesn't exist. This makes sense. Also note, by the way, a tiny side note, but no, note how Good eye, sir. How the editor and the error message do not agree on the order of the three and the ga, right? <laughs> this is in one screenshot. It is not even aligned with each other. It's like you run into this stuff all the time. So, should I define a variable name that isn't defined? This is a reasonable error message. Then, why is this 
invalid character in identifier. You know why I actually showed you like a hundred slides ago? Because this is the definition of a variable name. In Python, you are not allowed to start with a number. Also, if it's an Arabic number. So this is like Schrodinger's number. It's enough of a number that you cannot start a variable name with it, but it's not enough of a number that you can calculate with the number. So I'm like, hello, Python, I have an issue. <laughs> No one cares. I care about this because it's inconsistent and unfair. Luckily, though, Python is not all bad. They also have their good spots. If you convert the string Arabic 3 into an integer, you will actually get the numeral value 3. This is good. This is what I can use in my interpreter. So rather than taking the 3 and putting it into the range directly, I just, <laughs> I don't love this, of course, but I cast it into a string, and then I cast the string into an int, and then I get the number, and this works. So again, I am happy, <laughs> happy. All my unit tests are passing. Just let me see how it looks like in the front end. Remember, we use Sculpt, a re-implementation of Python in JavaScript. Felina, is this a complete re-implementation of Python in JavaScript? It is not, my friends, because this wicked part of Python, where an Arabic numeral is converted into an int if it's the string, they didn't implement this. So, uh, more work, more work. So now I have to write extra code to actually convert an integer with a dictionary into the right number and then convert it, where I have to overload the built-in int function. This is nice, now I teach students Python. I explain to them that you can overload a built-in function. And they're like, Professor, why would you ever overload a built-in function? I'm like, sit down, do I have the story for you? <laughs> there are really good reasons that you want to do this that are not very common, but they exist. So this now actually works. So in the front end of Hedy, this is like live, I'll show you a live demo in a bit. This is a for loop, uh, a for loop in Hedy. So it's like 4i in range 0 to 5, and it prints the counter. You can get output in R numerals if you want to, but you, there's a setting where it can also, again, cast the input back into the original numerals so that it shows in Arabic numerals or in any of the other numeral systems that we support. One more thing, just because I was like, why? <laughs> If you have here, this is a repeat, this is the number 10. I, with my Western brain, would think that the first character I encounter is a 1 and then a 0. That's 10, right? First a 1 and then the 0. No, no. The numbers in Arabic actually follow our direction. So this is not a 10. No, this is a 10. So now again, I have to say, again, this if in my parser. Well, if it's a number, you have to swap this and then put it back in the string and then send it to the parser. Because why not? <laughs> now it's not the pandemic anymore, and I'm still fixing bugs in the Arabic implementation. So Hadi is multilingual. Let's look at a demo. Why not? Let's do a live demo. That's always cool. So this is heading level one. It's now in English, but I could also set it to, well, Spanish, for example. And now everything becomes Spanish. And here I can use imprimer, and then if I run the code, then this just works. It also corrects, correctly parses. You see these exclamation marks. They go the other way. All these things just work. We have. Currently, 47 different languages supported, many different right-to-left languages like Arabic, Farsi, Urdu, Hebrew, um, many, as you can see, non-Latin languages like uh, Chinese, Japanese, all of them, many of them. So this is uh, Arabic. So here we have Arabic code. I can just copy this example. And it will just run. So this is an ask where, again, you ask something. And if I, for example, make an error here, so I destroy this keyword and I try to run the code, then I'll get an error message that's also in Arabic, and it will suggest the Arabic keywords that I mistype back to me. So all these things just work in all the different languages that we support. Yes, there we go. And sadly, if you have been cursed with this, 
you have to look at localization issues, then it can never be unseen. Suppose you go to Copenhagen and you want to go to the train station. Of course, this is not Copenhagen with the right character. This is actually K greater than on Google Maps. And I, again, you're like, <laughs> Why? Right? You can also just think, oh, this is a mistake. Let it go, Felina. No, I want to understand what's going on. Is this a rendering issue? Is it a rendering issue? Is there error in the database, but it's just not showing up, right? No, friends, this is in the database. If you search for k greater than, it will actually give you the train station. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> How? And if you search for K and then the actual character that it should, then it doesn't find, it finds the airport. It's not like wrong everywhere, but it doesn't find the train station. Yeah, you know, it's Google, it's a small company. They don't have money to test these type of things, right? They probably don't employ anyone that speaks Danish, so it makes total sense that they would screw up the train station of Copenhagen rendering, yeah. <laughs> So sadly now, I hope you are also infected with this virus of a letter is wrong, a number is wrong. I must send in issues and bug reports to people that screw up internationalization. One more thing I want to talk about. So we talked about the gradual nature of Hedy. We talked about the multilingual nature of Hedy. But there's one more thing that makes Hedy interesting and cool. And I think one of the reasons that we've been seeing amazing adoption in the past two years because it's a language that is built for teaching. And that's something I didn't understand initially, that there can be the, a difference between a language that's made for learning and a language that is made for teaching. Those are not the same thing. When I said those kids in my experiment said that these levels are step-by-step -step guides, this is also true for teachers we are hearing. Teachers say, hey, if I open Hedy, it tells me what to do. It tells the kids in my classroom what to start with. I don't have to figure out how to teach because everything is right there. And if you compare that to something like Scratch, you look at the interface, if you're either a kid or a teacher, what do, what do I do? What, what do I do next? Am I on the right path? It's very hard for learners to figure this out. Teachers look at this and they're like, yeah, I know, I understand what a variable is. I know what the loop is. What will they do next? So Scratch is a system that works really well for tiny felines, for kids that are motivated to explore and that will not be deterred if stuff doesn't work. And it also works fantastically well for one kid or maybe two or three kids with one skilled parent that can help them guide what they should do. But if you're a teacher that's maybe not so very versed in technology and also has 30 children in a classroom, you really don't have the time and energy to help all of them when they're stuck. So what we have in Hedy as well is adventures. Okay, let's set the UI back to something I can actually understand. And, and you can understand, otherwise I could do Dutch. So this is the Hedy interface, and it takes you through the things that are possible. So initially, it just explains, hey, welcome to level one. And then here it says, this is what you can do. You can print something, and then it will actually show up on the other side of the screen. And every adventure also has an exercise. Exercise, this is what you have to do. Here's a little program that lacks the keyword print, and you have to fill it out. And then kids will do this, of course. They will just run the code. And I said, no, 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 no. You have to first finish this code. So it's like mini exercises. It's gradualness in the gradualness. Every level shows you what to do. So then you do print here, and then it's like, yes, this is what you're meant to do. And then once you've practiced that, then it explains the next keyword to you. And then it says, hey, with those keywords that you now know, you can actually build something fun that is a parrot. It says, hey, I'm Hedy the Parrot. What is your name? And then you say, Gary. And then it says, Gary, Gary. So it shows kids this is a thing you can build. And if you don't want that, if you're the type of kid or parent or teacher that doesn't need that, you don't need to do that. We have this programmer's mode that will just, you know, do get rid of all the adventures. But if you're a teacher or a kid that wants this guidance, that wants to understand why am I doing this, what is the goal, then this is also built in into the interface. One more thing I want to talk about before we can go to Q&A, because we have a little bit of time, is 
classroom management. <laughs> I didn't think as a software engineer I would talk about that a lot, but it's so very important, right? If you are teaching a class, and still, still today I'm teaching in high school every week. Like I was teaching in high school Monday before I came here. Every week I'm still teaching, and also this 12-year-old age group. If you're teaching 12-year-olds, and let's say this is your lesson plan, then maybe you have one kid in your class that has done the thing you wanted them to do. You're like, yeah, you're my favorite. Don't tell the others. Well done. But then you also have kids that are, you know, maybe they're a little bit self-conscious. They're a bit scared of technology. Maybe it's the first time they're using a computer. This definitely happens in the school where I teach. Many 11, 12-year-olds, they're not on a computer at home. Computers are for email, for parents. Maybe they're on the phone, on their tablet, but they've never been in a computer. So they're like, oh, they did one thing. And like, teacher, teacher. What do I do now, right? What is my next step? That's what happens. And in the same classroom where you have this kid, you will also have this kid. It's like, teacher, teacher, I built this. Look how impressive it is. And now I would like the palm tree to be blue instead of green. Can you help me? Like, no, no, I cannot help you. <laughs> like, clean up your code. That, that, look at that. But this actually happens. So you have such a big difference in level in your classroom. And initially when I was teaching, all of my energy would go to this kid because this kid is me, right? This is fun. They're asking great questions. I also want to figure out what's going on here. But then after a while, and I actually like went to teacher school and learned about teaching, you have to think every Every day, every hour you have to think, why am I here, right? And I am not here for this kid. This kid will be fine. They don't really need the programming lessons to advance. I'm, I'm here for this kid. But if you have an open environment, something like Scratch, for example, or a Replit or a Python environment where everyone can do everything, it's inevitable that these kids will get in the way of the other kids. They will suck up the energy of the teacher. And also, I mean, they're obnoxious 12-year-olds. They will be like, Hey, oh, you have one block. I have 500 blocks. Oh, you're not so good at computing, are you? Right? So they will spread their enthusiasm in a way that isn't necessarily motivating for everyone. So what we also have in Hedy is teacher customization. So as a teacher, you are in full control of what happens in your classroom. Um, by the way, we have a teacher's manual as well, where all of these things are explained if you have a teacher's account. And if you have a teacher's account, you could also manage your classroom. So these are <laughs> my actual classes <laughs> from school. This is why my account is called Miss Hermans and not Feline. Uh, but this is a demo account. So there's one username in here. Um, and my class now is normal, but I can customize everything. So this is all the adventures that you just saw. This is all the levels. And if I go to Feline now, so this is me, another account in another browser. Everything is still there. But I can say as a teacher, well, I think this is a little bit overwhelming. So let's just remove these things, right? I don't think this is necessary now. And I'll just close the other levels. They're just not available. And then if I switch to me in the other browser, all the things will be gone. And then I cannot go to level two. Because it's blocked. It's oh, sorry, the UI is in Dutch, I'm now realizing. But this says your teacher hasn't made this available to you yet. So as a teacher, you can put this stop on the level of the classroom so that you can divide your attention towards the kids that really need your help. And if there's a kid that really wants to go to level two, but the others still need my help, I'm like, yeah, you know, you, you, you go do your, I don't know, do your German homework. Don't bother us. And this, I think, I didn't realize how powerful this actually was. This is the thing that works for teachers. Whereas I think many of the programming tools that we've created so far, like Scratch, but also all the types of robots you can build, those are programming education tools for parents that suffer from nostalgia. Right? That, they work for that type of parent. That was also us when we were kids. But they don't scale to a classroom that's 30 kids and that's a non-tech savvy teacher. So that, this is a feature where I didn't think I need it. Now that I have it, I like it. And definitely teachers that are less technology advanced need this. So that's it. One question that people often ask me, like, why is Hedy Hedy? Hedy is actually named after Hedy Lamarr, a famous movie actress, but also an inventor. If you want to help out with Hedy, we would very much love that. Or like along the three lines that we talked about, there's three ways that you can help Hedy. 
And he is a graduate language, so if you want to work on an innovative parser, if this is something you really like, then you're very welcome to join our team. Uh, we write papers also about parsing. Uh, if you know a little bit about parsing, parser frameworks are made for one language, exactly one language, and certainly not for 18 dialects, uh, tr small changes in languages. So this paper actually describes an extension to EBNF, which is a grammar framework that allows grammars to gradually build upon each other. If you want to add or extend translations, like we're super happy with 40 level 47 languages, but more languages is better. This is what we have now. This is Danish. Bit sad, so a little bit has been translated in Danish, but definitely not everything. So then we could definitely use your help or with any of the other languages or adding new languages. If you want to bring Hedy to teachers, if you are a teacher or you know teachers, then definitely point them towards our framework. Uh, the platform is free. It's free for teachers. It's free for as many accounts as you want. So you can definitely send people there. And we have a lot of videos and channels on Discord where teacher ca teachers can help out each other. We have the teacher's manual, as I already saw. We're really, really trying to get this to teachers because we believe this framework can really, really make a difference. And the best way to join is very easy, haiti.org slash join. And with that, I think we have a few minutes for Q&A if there's questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. This is a great question. So if you use Hedy in all lo levels localized, is there a barrier into switching into actual Python? Yeah, the sad answer is yes. Because once you leave our frame in level 18, you can do a localized subset of Python in Chinese or Arabic, and then you have to switch to English. So one answer to that is, this is not my problem. Why isn't Python localized, right? Um, and that's, that's sort of a joke answer, but also a real answer. So I, I have a paper coming out in a few weeks that is a paper that says, if you want to localize your programming language, here's 12 things to think about. That's like this talk in six hours in a paper. Um, so I, I really hope that with the pioneering work that we have been doing into localized grammars, that other programming languages also think, hey, we could do this. I mean, in a certain sense, I'm an amateur, right? My job is to be a university professor. I'm not a professional programming programmer. And together with the open source community, we, we have been able to do this. So other programming languages could also do this. And there are programming languages exploring this. Actually, Elm, which is a functional language for the front end, they have just started a working group to localize the language. Rust has a working group to localize error messages. So hopefully this sort of is spreading. So th that is one answer. And another answer is, we had initially really seen Hedy as a frame as a temporary framework where you go like through the levels and then you go. We see more and more people hanging out in the higher levels l in localized languages. So maybe we should also expand the power of the language a little bit. Initially, we didn't have functions. We, we, are a we have just added functions so that there's more power, so that you can learn more while still being in this localized context. Yeah, oh, go ahead. We have a few more minutes. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So, so could you at the end say, hey, here's some lessons to graduate to full Python. This is a freedom that we now allow teachers. So all the languages are, you can always mix in English in any language. So as a teacher, you can say, well, we do level one in Arabic and then in English. This is a, an option you have. As a teacher, you can say, well, up to level six, you're allowed Arabic, but then we switch English. And in the teacher backend, that's even a little bit richer than the thing you saw about customizing the layouts, you can also enable or disable the option for kids to switch. So if, as a teacher, if you want to, you can say, well, after level 10, you're not allowed to switch back because now we have to go to the grown-up or the English version. So we really leave that up to teachers. We know some teachers do levels twice, so first in their own language and then in English, and that some language, some teachers just allow everyone to use the language that we want. In my classroom, kids can use Dutch or English. They can mix it if they want to, but of course Dutch and English are sort of the same language. So other languages with a bigger distance to English might make different decisions. This is why we leave it up to teachers. 
If people want to have stickers, I have Haley stickers here, so you can be free to pick one up. The stickers are also localized. So I have Dutch stickers, Arabic stickers, Chinese stickers, and English stickers. Thank you for your attention.